Hi, this is May Sayed Ali, and I'm the host of the G42 On Air podcast series. We are excited to be recording the G42 On Air live from Jartex at the G42 stand. With me today is Talal Al Qaisi, G42 Cloud CEO. Talal's professional experience spans a wide range of industries, including space, energy, and government. In his current role, Talal focuses on evolving the company to the next level through providing world-class cloud services, data products, and AI solutions to a variety of industries. We will talk about how we can explore ways that work harder for clients and for the positive progress of society. Good morning, Talal. It's so great having you with us today at Jiretech. Super exciting to be here. Likewise, thank you for having me. Talal, it's been such a long time since we came at Jiretech, and can you see the traffic? It's crazy I mean, outside. You know, it's crazy that this is the 42nd anniversary. It was brought to my attention that it's the 42nd anniversary of of Jitex. and so uh, it's very fitting for G42's first appearance at this technology conference to take place during this uh, very momentous occasion for them too. So I'm uh, very excited. Me too, and especially our topic today is very much going with the theme of Jitex and, and what we're doing here. So, but before we, we dig into uh, G42 and the cloud, I'd like to know a little bit more about you. You know, Talal, when I first met you, you were at the spa in the space, right? I was, I was yeah. not in space, but and, like in the space like industry. In the space yeah. industry, kind of, <laughs> and you were in the space. Yeah, my head was in the, <laughs> was in the space, in space exactly. yes. Yeah. Then somehow you came back to Earth and then you went to the cloud. So can you just tell us a little bit more, like what's going on there? Yeah, I didn't really come back to Earth. I was on Earth before going to space, technically, if you look okay. at it from a career perspective. I spent nine years at the UAE Embassy in Washington, D.C., uh, where I held a, a role uh, supporting the bilateral trade relationship, and I, I was in charge of commercial affairs. And uh, through my tenure, I fell in love with space because it became one of the many sectors that we were involved in. And uh, the technologies that we were uh, after, especially for our Mars mission, were, were things that I was getting really excited about in terms of not just the technology component, but the answers of the big questions that we were trying to unlock, particularly around Mars and life on the universe. And uh, if we're the only ones on this, uh, uh, well, we have life on, on Earth, but can there be a proliferation of life in billions of planets all over the place? So these were the nice, interesting things that I was dealing with with space. Uh, then I you know, moved back here to the UAE and uh, joined the space agency to help continue to build an investing forcing function for the space industry and attract companies here. And it was only around that point in 2020, I think, when I uh, met our group CEO, Peng, uh, who uh, kind of, when he, when he told me what 42 was and that it came from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and then said that AI is this interesting uh, human intelligence augmenting uh, uh, aspect that could help you unlock uh, the deepest answers about everything from 10 to the power of 12, which is where you measure light years yes. and space, to 10 to the minus 12 when you look at a molecular level of some of the things we're doing with genomics, I was sold. So I took, I wouldn't call it a leap of faith, but a jump of confidence into the private sector. And uh, here I am. So I did. When I met you, I was uh, handling space affairs and how you apply space to uh, AI to space. And you gave me the book, I remember. That's right, The Hitchhiker's Guide yes, to the Galaxy. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anytime anyone asks me the number 42, like, I have to. <laughs> yeah. But, but so, I, you know, we, we were able to really do some incredible things around remote sensing, uh, geospatial analytics. Uh, and then all of a sudden, out of the blue, Peng comes to me and says, I have a radical idea for you. I'm like, what's new, Peng? And he says, I want you to go run the cloud division. And I'm thinking, you know, from space to the cloud, and now I have my head in the clouds. But, exactly. um, but it was an interesting altitude demotion, but uh, a lot more work and a lot more complex, I can tell you, than rocket science, for sure. It's more complex. That's it, very interesting. Yeah. We're going to dig a little bit deep into it today. Uh, and, and this is where you're going to be sharing with me what's going on with the G42 cloud. This is such an exciting, interesting journey, Talal. You are an overall, like, when I talk to you about any other topic, you know everything. No, so I'm sure you know so much about the cloud, which I don't know of. And today I'm going to learn, and with the audience, we're going to learn so much about what's happening in G42 and the cloud space. You know, I've, I've, I've read so much about the G42 cloud, and it says that it's building the MENA region's largest and the most powerful cloud infrastructure designed to make organizations more intuitive, agile, efficient, to solve real-world challenges, clouds, and, and enabler and enable for a digital transformation. So all of that, what does that mean? Like what kind of things you are enabling in uh, yeah. G42 Cloud? And, and what, uh, if you want to say in a different way, like uh, what wasn't possible before that now Cloud can actually do? 
Okay. All right. There's a lot in there. So let's uh, maybe um, uh, dissect it a little bit. So okay. uh, uh, taking a step back, G42, I, I, at least the cloud division or the cloud, uh, uh, you know, um, a practice within G42 was born out of a need. The need was to help uh, solve some of the different things that we were trying to do on the AI side of things a few years ago, where we had established at that time ourselves as a very strong uh, contender in uh, big data analytics. And I'm sure you're going to be speaking to some of our colleagues from G42 Analytics. And I think you spoke to Thomas already yes, before. Already, so there's yeah. quite a bit that we are doing. And we're, we've, we've created a very interesting uh, value proposition around uh, data. And, um, and so cloud was a consequence of wanting to scale that strategy beyond what you could physically do with an on-prem type of solution. And, uh, and you needed the elasticity that cloud affords. So that's kind of, I think, to the second part of your question, where having the infrastructure uh, of cloud, and this is no different than anything that you would get from an AWS or a Google or a Alibaba or a Huawei or whoever is playing in the cloud domain. They're providing infrastructure as a service predominantly, and then they have some other solutions in platform and software. But, but that infrastructure, it's mainly compute, storage, network. And so from the very basic level, we have a very uh, uh, strong and comparable uh, value proposition to many of the big players. The difference that we were able to uh, introduce was sovereignty. And I think that's where I think, um, uh, you know, we can command a certain level of uh, not just a premium, but, but a differentiated value proposition to many of the customers that really uh, are interested in that uh, dynamic. What does that mean when you say sovereignty? So, the, the, you know, the, uh, increasingly in today's world, you're seeing that uh, data, there's a proliferation of data, right? So the last time I checked one of the uh, statistics IDC, I think, had was that in the global, uh, what they call data sphere, there's about 64 zettabytes of data and growing, and growing at, a, at, a, at an exponential rate yeah. as well, especially enterprise level. And the main- Can you say again the number? What's zeta, the number? Zettabyte. So don't ask me how many zeros that <laughs> okay. is. Look it up. But a zettabyte is more than a petabyte or a gigabyte or any of those other okay. bytes that you heard. So, Something new yeah. today. Yeah. So yeah, that I, I did as well, because to me, that means that there's no way a human could potentially look through and sift through all that data to unlock the full potential of that data. Yeah. And so today, most of this is being um, generated by IoT solutions, uh, especially since everything has a sensor. So every, everything is leaving a digital footprint. And so that needs to be kind of, um, you know, there needs to be a repository for all that data so you could then be able to make sense out of it. And you need to use automated ways or AI, and it is a buzzword and it's a very loaded term, but generally speaking, what you can do with analytics and AI, the more data you have, the more you can feed that AI. Data is like food. AI is like the brain, and then the compute, which we provide in terms of infrastructure and cloud, is like the muscle, per se. So that's kind of how you look at that organism that we are cry trying to build, and that food we are providing in terms of data is what's allowing you to unlock some very interesting insights and, and value and predictive analytics, not just analyzing what happened in the past, but analyzing what may happen in the future and basing your decisions around that. This is how you're supporting organizations and governments to come up with the best decisions. Yes, yeah, let's say, and, yeah. and sorry, I, I mean, I, I kind of skipped over the sovereignty part, yeah. but so, so those data sets are very sensitive. And so increasingly you're finding um, uh, either enterprise businesses or governments that are, are, are hesitant to have their uh, sensitive workloads on public clouds that could be subject to foreign jurisdiction. So what we solve for here is we, you know, have full jurisdictional control, full ownership, full access controls over the, the cloud. So everything from the connectivity layer to the data centers now that obviously with Fesna and our group, we, we as a cloud provider are leasing from Fesna and then to the cloud stack and then what we provide to the client. It's not just residency like other cloud service providers can provide if they have their physical infrastructure here, but pure sovereignty as well. So this is something new that the big players don't have, basically. Uh, they, they might claim to have a flavor of it, but it's hard when, it's, uh, when, when uh, governments that they yes. uh, are subject to from a jurisdictional standpoint uh, uh, are, are come into play at the same time. So, yeah. so we, we, we are able to inspire a different level of confidence. Again, these are for certain data classifications where it's necessary, public sector. Increasingly now you're seeing, because of some of the things that we've um, uh, experienced in the past few years, um, you're seeing financial services, healthcare, energy, start to weigh their data in the same way that national security data would need to be on a sovereign cloud. Because, you know, genomics data is very sensitive data. It could tell a lot, especially when you start to aggregate it with health records. And when you aggregate it with, um, uh, you look at the energy sector, seismic data for reservoir analysis could provide indications of future production capacity. So these are sensitive workloads. 
the financial services, many things that could be derived out of those data sets that countries tend to, whether they're in the private sector or state-owned, try to keep sovereign. This is a huge value for your clients, I believe so. So oh, actually, wait, you're talking about so many things and I can see it's a quite crowded space. So I know I understand now, based on what you're saying, G42's you world-class infrastructure is built to serve governments, special industrial enterprises, and this right. is what, what really matters, right? It's mostly B2B and government sectors. So and it's all sizes and leverages the power of AI to deliver the superior performance. Yes. But, okay, so if we want to talk about the, the differences, uh, what, I mean, you spoke about the sovereignty, you spoke about um, supporting your clients on all of these different levels and having G42 as the backbone, let's say, of the cloud and the analytics of AI and uh, uh, what you spoke about earlier with another podcast. But if you want to share with me, this is, we have, if you want to explain to the audience, we have the basic or the standard uh, structure of yeah. the cloud, but then what else do you provide? So if we're looking at it comparably to other cloud service providers, there's very little we don't do that they do in terms of at least the basic services. But again, I think our existence uh, here is not mutually exclusive to the existence of an AWS, a Google, a Microsoft. In fact, I would love to work more with them on finding compatible ways to work. And, and in, in essence, we aren't going after the consumer business or the small medium enterprises uh, the way they, they do, because we wouldn't be as competitive as they are. And then we don't have a global footprint in the same context that they do. Our global um, expansion strategy is sovereign clouds in different places. They have a, a great global footprint that can allow the scalability of businesses that want to go internationally. So the customer persona that we target is very different than theirs. So, you know, we're very selective about uh, which industries we, we choose to uh, go after. Again, the same, same ones I mentioned, energy, financial services, healthcare, in addition to what we've done uh, and our heritage in the public sector and providing services to the government. Um, apart from sovereignty, I think what kind of also now starts to differentiate us from the, the, the mix is that, um, you know, things like data management, where we are now excelling because of, again, the heritage that we have across the board on G42, I'm trying to double down on in terms of a value proposition that kind of also kind of serves the sovereignty element, but also provides different products and solutions around AI and big data. It's amazing, it's a lot of the, the amount of information that you have in the sense of like, when I think of the cloud and infrastructure, I never thought of it to that perspective, that you are more focused on the government, uh, B2B, the financial sectors, the public sectors, the health and safety. So that makes total sense. But if we wanna now dig into, um, like having been in the space and in, in industry, and then another technology domain powering the artificial intelligence space. What would you say? What does the future hold for us? Yeah. In general, I think I can get very philosophical and we can go on all day, but... Um, I, I, I would... like your philosophy, so let, let's go there then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if everyone would agree with it, but I think uh, generally speaking, if you, if you think of what we have... Uh, so I'll, I'll give you the example and the analogy on space. Uh, space to me, I started enjoying when I understood the enablement that it provides and the potential for that enablement to be unlocked because it, in, in initially it was very prohibitive. Not anyone could send something to space. Yeah. But you look at what came about after uh, NASA sent uh, people to the moon in the 60s and early 70s and the ancillary benefits of that investment. It, it, it's, um, it's mind boggling to see some of the technologies that were uh, derivatives of that mission. Now, it cost multiple billions of dollars and there was a, a forcing function of the Cold War between Russia and the US that kind of generated that, right? So, so today with space, you're seeing people like Elon Musk landing rockets and, and the access to space isn't as prohibitive. So it's created new opportunities for business model innovation around uh, low earth orbit satellites, which now unlock new use cases in different, uh, like Uber couldn't be possible without GPS satellites. Certain communications and uh, remote sensing could not be possible without bringing down the cost of access of space and sending something to orbit and then create, having companies here leverage that new infrastructure. Similarly, uh, when you look at cloud and what cloud has enabled, you compare it to before cloud, and this is not a very long time ago. We're talking about you know, the early 2000s uh, when, when AWS first started uh, you know, and, and Microsoft started getting their SaaS products on the cloud. It's a, it's a fairly relative, a relatively new domain and it's growing exponentially because again, it's something that's needed. It's somewhere um, and most companies can continue to focus on their core and outsource the headache of managing infrastructure and uh, replenishing that after uh, end of life cycles. 
And it's giving people the ability to focus on more important things and others to manage that infrastructure for them and build innovative AI products and solutions on top of. So I think if you look at the future, then um, anything that's going to move the needle from artificial narrow intelligence, which we live in today, to artificial general and then super intelligence, assuming any rate of progress, you know, some people would say that could happen in the next 10 years, some people say it'll happen in 100 years, but in the cosmic scale of things, those are very trivial. Before before we go yeah. dig deeper into that, when you say the uh, the narrow artificial intelligence yeah. and we talk about the generic, what does that mean? Yeah, so, so today, I mean, like my, my Tesla can drive uh, in the center of a lane and ke lane keep and, uh, you know, adaptive cruise better than I can as yeah. a human because it's super intelligent in that narrow function. But when you have a generalized version of that intelligence that can then self-learn and then recursively self-improve because we invented it, right? And we created that AI. That AI that's super intelligent that could effectively then become general and create, uh, effectively replace, uh, recursively self-improve. So it could, could create another version of itself that's incrementally better. Then you get to a point where it gets to, uh, you know, those, uh, I guess some people would look at it dystopically like a Terminator scenario or the matrix and living in a simulation. I look at it as how do you augment human intelligence and how do you create more value to allow humans to be more creative and do less of the type of work that seems redundant and yeah. that a computer can do better. But on a general basis, I think that would be something where it's on par with human intelligence. And, and think about that for a second. You're, you're talking about another form factor that since the beginning of Earth 4.5 billion years ago, in this universe of 13.7 billion years, that there is, and humanity, say, roughly 200,000 years, there will be an, a more intelligent form factor than a human being. And the reason we put, you know, stronger, per se, animals in zoos, for example, uh, is because we're more intelligent and we know how to communicate and we use technology. Now imagine a technology that gets uh, actually a lot more uh, su su superior. And, and, and I don't look at the Terminator scenario, I look at values, you know. So can we instill the right types of values in an AI that we create, share the same values? I mean, today you have multiple countries in this race to AI. We're lucky in the UAE to be one of those countries and G42 is the champion of the AI. But we're doing it in a very responsible way, looking at ways to augment human intelligence, not necessarily build, a, build an AI just for the sake of building something that's smarter than humanity and not doing it with ethical considerations in mind. You know, when you're talking, I sense like you're an AI talking to me now with a human intelligence. <laughs> you never know. Some people say that uh, some, pe <laughs> some people say that this is a simulation and that we are an ancestor simulation for a future civilization. And if you look at it statistically, it's plausible. So that, this is kind of getting me like, really <laughs> excited. But before we close this topic, you know, you spoke about the whole full picture and we discussed many different aspects. Okay. But when you put the cloud as part of this um, whole transformation in the future, how is this cloud helping and inspiring um, our future to become, you know, the matrix side or the transformation oh. side or the values that you are adding? How are you adding these values through the cloud? So the cloud is a, is a, a foundational layer in that digital infrastructure that enables uh, intelligence and uh, the ability to do analytics at a larger scale than is possible with any type of limited uh, setup in terms of uh, on-prem solutions perhaps. Or, so the elasticity of cloud, the new services that are being developed by many of the cloud providers, those that we uh, compete with and those that we try to collaborate with, uh, it's, a, it's a fundamental foundational layer that's enabling the digital transformation generally of uh, multiple different industries and, uh, in my opinion, humanity as well. Thank you so much, Sadal. That was absolutely great. I have so much information to go through for our next session in the future. And maybe uh, we'll have uh, our session in the space. You never know. <laughs> you never know. Loud in the space. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you once good. again for, having, Thank you. for being with us today. Appreciate it. Thank you. That brings us to the end of the show. We hope that this conversation has contributed to your foundation of how G42 Cloud is exploring ways to drive positive progress in society. Thanks for listening to G42 On Air. If you enjoy our show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And be sure to come back next time. Until then, this is May Sayed Ali signing off from Jitex.